Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be gathered as God's people. Every time we come together, I appreciate Doug's words about consistency. That is what we do. It's what we need. Uh, and God deserves that praise that we can bring him every single time we gather, every single week. Uh, it, as he said it so well, it doesn't get old. It doesn't get tired. It's new. Uh, all the blessings of God are new every morning. We know that from Lamentations, and so uh, glad that you're here praising him for those blessings that he just keeps showering upon us. He doesn't give us blessing because we're doing so well. He gives blessing to literally everybody on the planet, hoping that it will draw them to him. And so we're part of that response today, now wanting to our hearts to be drawn toward him. Glad you're here today. Uh, before we begin the lesson, let's go to the Father in prayer. Dear Lord, you have been so good to us, and when trouble comes, when hardship comes, Father, we know that it does, just doesn't balance with all the good that has come to us because of your hand and because of your blessing. And yet, Father, we pray that you do see us through those times. Help us to stay focused. Help us to realize that you are a good God who is watching over us. Help us to lean on your care as your word tells us to. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This series, Do the Tough Stuff, as it's been called, I tried to find, you know, some jobs out there, some situations where you don't want somebody neglecting the difficult job that they have. Uh, and I want to introduce you to this guy. Uh, this is a Bothrop's Asper. And I only know that because I saw it on uh, on. What you, with, oh, Wikipedia. Yeah, this is all from Wikipedia. But this, I, I saw a, a show about this, and this commonly is known as the furred lance snake. Now, it looks just like a rattlesnake, and in fact, it, it's really difficult to see. It's so well camouflaged uh, that you could be walking through the rainforests of Brazil, and this guy would be right there. You wouldn't even know it. It looks like a rattlesnake, but there's no rattle, right? You know the rattle that warns you, hey, don't get any closer. No, this little, you know, danger noodle, right, Leah? This little guy, he doesn't even give you any warning. He just says, I, you're, you're too close. I'm coming after you. But here's the deal. He causes more deaths than any other American reptile. How about that? So he's got the record. He's holding the record for that. And it's because in one bite, he delivers up to 200 milligrams of venom in one strike. 50 milligrams is lethal for humans. So he's overdoing it. He could probably knock down an elephant if he had to, if they, if they were in the Amazon rainforest. But that's how bad this snake is. So this snake's out there. And as I said, if you're you know, walking the rainforest, that's a cause for concern. But here's the deal. That figure about it causing more deaths, it, that number is going down all the time. And in fact, if you're at the right place, for example, if you're in Costa Rica, and you get bit by this snake, the likelihood of you dying from it is almost zero. You know why? Because of a guy like this. What's his job? His job is that every night he goes out looking for these snakes. Oh, to put them to death, right, Mike? To, like, <laughs> to, to, to remove them, this scourge from the earth. No, in fact, he finds them so that they can make the antivenom that you would get in the hospital that would save your life, that would save your leg because this, I don't wanna get into the details, but it gets real nasty what this venom does to you before it kills you, right? It, it does some horrible things to you. These guys, they take the venom, they excrete the venom, they use horses to develop the, the serum inside and then they're able to save your life. And there was a guy who does you know, Discovery Channel type shows and he got bit by one of these and they said that uh, the Spanish name, the ter, or the Mexican, or the English Spanish name, uh, Tercipiolo, and he realized, oh man, I'm in serious trouble. But he got to the right hospital and he was fine. He said, it was almost like from the site where they injected me with the antivenom, it's like this peacefulness, this peaceful bliss just spread all over his body because it was taking care of the venom. What if these guys decide, you know what? This is a tough job, you know? I'm putting my own life in danger. I'll, I, I'm gonna go become a garbage man instead. 
look, somebody's got to do this. Somebody's got to get out there. They've got to do the tough stuff. And that's what we're kind of getting at with this whole series. Somebody's got to be doing the hard things spiritually. And Christians are called upon by God, and God's almost you know, putting it in our hands saying, take this job and go do it. We need people out there who are going to do it. Today is especially difficult because we're talking about hardship. And basically the idea is we're going to talk about enduring hardship as a difficult thing that you and I are called to do in Christ as Christians. Um, Take, for example, our, our theme scripture. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. One who remains steadfast under trial. Now, James calls it a trial. You know, it can, and that's really any trouble that comes along. And when we encounter trouble, it really doesn't matter what it is, there is an immediate reaction that we're going to have. It's going to involve emotion. It's going to involve, you know, how we feel about these things. And that's not something that you can really control. I mean, even Mr. Rogers teaches us this, right? Mr. Rogers has the song, what do you do with the mad that you feel, right? Because sometimes something happens and it just makes us mad. It's not that we've already done something wrong, or, you know, but the, those emotions just pop up. It's a reaction. It's a, an initial feeling that we have. The trick, though, is what then happens next? How do we respond? Now, I know reaction and response are basically the same word, but I'm using the word response as I'm choosing the next thing I'm going to do. What am I going to do next? I've encountered this trouble. I'm having this initial reaction, but where does it lead me? Well, the thing is, there are lots of ways to respond, and most of them fall under the category of what I'm calling a sarx response. Sarx is that wonderful Greek word that means many things, but it basically just means, uh, you know, flesh. But it has to do with worldliness or sinfulness. Paul uses it in contrast to the spirit. And what I mean is, all those emotions that we have initially, all those reactions that well up inside of us, the, re the usual response would be to say, okay, well, then I'm just going to act on those emotions. I'm going to act on those reactions. So if this causes me pain, I'm going to lash out. If this causes me sadness, I'm just going to give up on life. I'm going to crawl into a hole in despair. All right? So there's all kinds of ways we can react, but most of them fall in that category. But as Christians, we are called not to the sarks or the, the worldly, the fleshly response, but we're called to the spirit response, the pneuma response, which is the Greek word for spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that Satan and whatever is, is not going to try to use these emotions to force us into, you know, or, or, or encourage us, you know, push us into a kind of flesh response. That's still happening. The difference, though, the difference between the Sark's response and the pneuma response is that those emotions come up against a solid block of granite that we call endurance. And that is what we want to talk about today. When trouble comes, those emotions come, of course they're going to be there. But then will you take that time to endure? Will you take a moment and take a breath so that you can think through and realize God wants me to take this response rather than this one? Last week, we talked about discernment, and we said that one of the keys to discernment is that you need to give yourself time. You have to allow yourself a little bit of time because if you just react you know, spontaneously, if you're always hasty, as Proverbs says, then it's not going to be good for you. It's not going to be productive for you. And so endurance gives you that time. It gives you a little bit of breathing room. It makes you say, okay, what are my options here, and what is the godly option? What is the spirit option rather than simply, you know, what my desires or what my emotions would pull me into. So our task is to develop endurance. Develop endurance. Every time I hear endurance, I, I'm like Doug. You know, Doug uses soccer examples. Well, when I was in high school, I was a swimmer. and I was, I was an okay swimmer, and I was a terrible volleyball player. So you're going to see a lot of those kinds of analogies, right? 
But when I was swimming, I realized I wasn't going to be faster than most of the other guys I was swimming with. This was my freshman year. But my coach put me into an event nobody else wanted to swim. And I got put into the 500. It's 500 yards. I've talked about this before. But the 500. And he put me in, and I didn't give up. I didn't die. And so that became my event, right? That, that's how you earn your spot in the 500, okay? It is uh, 20 lengths of the pool. So, well, there, back, there, back, there, back. You know, 20 lengths of the pool. Um, it's a 15-minute event. Just imagine that. Just the, the event itself is at least 15 minutes. And it's scheduled for the slot right after the mid-meet break. So picture this, right? Everybody takes a break, all the swimmers, you know, go and they get something in the snack bar. All the people who are watching the swimmers are dying of heat. It's 150 degrees in every pool, right? And so they're dying. They get out to the hallway and they're, they're breathing. They're also at the snack bar. And as they're getting their nachos, they hear that an event is starting. And they look at each other and they say, oh, no, are they starting again? And they say, no, 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 it's just the 500. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You have 15 more minutes before anything is really happening. That's what it's like to swim the 500. It's the only event where they count the laps for you. They don't even trust you to keep track of where you are. And when you're competitively swimming this, you really can't keep track. And every little thing becomes a big thing over 20 lengths of the pool. I'll give you an example. I'm a freshman, I'm 14 years old, so I have no sense of responsibility and whatnot. So one day I just forgot my goggles. Can you imagine a swimmer forgetting his go or her goggles? I mean, that's like, it's like forgetting to breathe. Uh, and so I realized I got to borrow some goggles. So I, I borrowed goggles from a friend, and they were a different style. They had none of the usual cushiness around that creates that nice suction around your eyes. It was like the European style that was just plastic right up to your eyeballs, right? It just frames your eyeballs. It sits inside your eye sockets. It's the most uncomfortable thing you can imagine. And I didn't have them tight enough. So I dove into the water. There are no quick, like the, the good thing about the 500 is you don't have to worry about your start. Like, oh, I gotta get the fastest start possible. People are like, they, they sound the beep and people are like, okay, whoo, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a long race. I mean, it's not gonna make that much of a difference. But I do that nice and leisurely dive in, that nice leisurely start. But right away, a tiny, just a tiny amount of water gets in there and Little by little, it starts to fill up over the first couple of lengths and to the point where every time I'm moving, I feel like I'm getting more and more. And I felt almost claustrophobic, you know, because there's just, just water stuck to my eyeballs. I grabbed it and I threw it and I hit the kid who was counting the lengths for me. It was a mess. It was terrible. So many things can go wrong. So here's the question. How do you prepare to swim 500 yards competitively? Now, you could probably swim 500 yards. I probably could right now. It would just take me an hour, right? It would take me a long time. I could take breaks, you know, get a drink, you know, that sort of thing. I could probably do it over time, but to do it competitively, to do it where you're not totally going to embarrass yourself, what does it take? Simple. One simple thing. Swim thousands of yards during every practice, two hours a day for months. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. You get to practice and they say, oh, good. Okay, Mike, you're going to do three 1,000s and then one 2,000. You say, okay, I'm not going to see anybody. I'm not going to see my friends. I'm just going to hear this for the next two hours. And that's all it is. You just keep swimming. But that's the, that's the key. You swim more so that when you are in that competition, you're able to handle it. You can do it. You can endure, in other words. That's how you do it. And that's why most people don't do it, because they don't want to spend that time doing it. I certainly didn't want to until that was the only choice I had. That's what James is getting at in the verse that uh, Jim also read. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And that's our endurance word. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Think of this endurance as what is going to help you, enable you to handle the next hardship. As you endure, as those emotions reach that bit of granite, realize, okay, if I can make it through this, if I can endure this, 
that I'm strengthening myself for the next trials that might come, for the next bit of trouble. That's, I think that's the only way you can even get a glimpse of the joy that James mentions there. Because otherwise, who's going to take joy in a hardship of any kind, any kind of trouble? You're not going to take joy in it unless it might have benefits for me down the road if I can endure it, if I can face it with the kind of reaction that is honoring to God. It's also what Hebrews talks about as far as God's discipline. It is for discipline that you have to endure. There's our word again. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So God wants to train us. He doesn't want us to stay where we are. He wants this family, this team, to be getting better and better, to be, be stronger as we move through life. And he wants us to become more holy like he is to have the fruit of righteousness as we are trained by the discipline he puts for us, that puts in front of us. So when we look at this, we realize, okay, sometimes God wants us to endure something so that we can have our eyes open to either the sin choice or the choice that honors him. So he wants us to develop endurance for several reasons. So let's think, how, what questions can we ask ourselves or what can we do to develop endurance? The first thing, it's to slow down, think, and pray. If we can take that moment, those moments, to simply slow ourselves down, those reactions, those emotions that want to take over, if we can slow them down, think, and pray, we can begin to develop endurance, have an endurance reaction. Ask ourselves, what emotions want to grab the wheel during this hardship? What is it? Can I pinpoint how I'm feeling? Is it, is it just that I'm angry? And, and if so, is it justified anger? See, I take, take some time. I can think it through. I can think about my reactions. Is it just pain? Is it grief? Is it mourning? What is it that is trying to take over? There's always this question, is God trying to get my attention? Do I need to face up to a sin that I've ignored? When we come up against trouble, we can't always just say sin has nothing to do with it because of what Hebrews just taught us, just told us. Sometimes God wants to get my attention, so I have to ask myself, is there a sin that I haven't confessed to him that I've sort of, you know, been hanging on to and haven't dealt with, haven't gone to him and prayed about? If God is allowing this pain, what will I gain from this training? And that's a hard question. That's a difficult one because the pain the, or the, the emotions that arise sometimes blind us, sometimes make things foggy as we are thinking about the potential gains. And then finally, and this is the best one, who has God placed in my life as a source of strength to help me endure this moment? Galatians chapter 6, it's talking about how we have to bear each other's burdens, come along next to each other. I'm not supposed to be out there all alone. I'm not just, you know, the marathon runner who's off by himself. I am surrounded by brothers and sisters who are undergoing the same kind of trials, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, as I said, we have options. And what I want to look at is two different examples. I'm calling this giving out or holding firm, two examples. I'm going to give the negative example first. And this is Jesus describing sort of like the end times, you know, what's going to happen toward the end uh, in both the church and in the world. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. I just want to highlight when we get that trouble that he's talking about. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Mike, this is supposed to be good news. It's supposed to be uplifting today. Hey, this is the words of Jesus describing how things can get. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased the love of many will grow cold now as i said this is not just oh the world's reaction because 
the love that he talks about there is agape love, the kind of love that Christians are supposed to be having for each other. And so the question is, what's happening here? The troubles have come, and those who should have endured, those who should have made it through with the right kind of reaction, are having the opposite. They're, they're falling away. They're, they're turning in their brothers and sisters. Their love is growing cold because the contrast is, verse 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The contrast is the one who endures. All the rest that we've just looked at here, the, the reactions of what if, this is, these are people with no endurance. These are people who have not taken any time to strengthen endurance in their Christian character. Those who hit trouble and all of a sudden they say, well, what's the escape route? How do I get out of this trouble? And the easy way is, I just, I set aside my faith. I set aside my love for my brothers. I give up. I, I walk away from the fight. The other example, and it is actually the same kind of example, is Paul when he's writing to the Philippians. Take a look at this. Yes, and I will rejoice. Just a little bit of context. Paul is in chains when he's writing this. Just as the people in, in, that Jesus described were under persecution, Paul is under persecution. Paul is facing arrest. Paul is facing charges unfairly. Yes, and I will rejoice, he says. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Oh, so Paul is thinking he's going to get out of his chains. Hang on. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Wow. So what's Paul saying? He's saying the trouble has come for me. And my biggest concern is not that I'm going to die or that I'm going to experience the pain of being imprisoned, my big concern is that I'll be ashamed. That I will have the wrong kind of response. That I won't honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, I'm hoping that by your strength and by the strength I receive from Jesus himself, that I will endure this. That the worst thing that will happen to me is not pain, imprisonment, or even death. The worst thing would be is that I would not endure this with my faith intact, with my love for you intact, without honoring God. And so I will honor him in my body in life or death. That is the endurance response. That's the spirit-led response, the pneuma response. That's enduring hardship the right kind of way. For centuries, people have prayed to God in times of trouble. And the interesting is, thing is that when God came to this earth, he endured. He came right alongside us and endured hardship, endured pain. Over and over again in the Psalms, you have lines like this. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Almost the entire book of Lamentations asks this question in various ways. But psalm after psalm you can go to, and this is the question. Why are you distant in my time of trouble? Why are you so far from saving me? And the question is, why don't you come with your power and fix everything? And so the idea was, okay, if God would show up, if God would come, we're in the middle of our troubles. We're, having a, we're trying to endure. We're trying to make it through. But when he comes... He'll snap his fingers and everything will just be great. He'll fix these problems. I won't have these enemies giving me a hard time. I won't have this disease that's, that's knocked me down. I won't have the feelings of grief and mourning and loss. But the strange thing, the twist in all of this, is that when God came in the flesh, he didn't just fix all of humanity's problems. He came down right next to us and felt what we feel in the midst of hardship. When we come and we sing and we remember Jesus Christ, you need to keep in mind we are remembering somebody who didn't stay distant from hardship, also didn't come to fix it all, but came alongside of us and endured it as he is calling us to do.
That's the kind of guy you are talking about when you're talking about Jesus Christ. The, the, the one, the Lord, that you have placed yourself behind to follow for the rest of your life. Hebrews says it so clearly. Let us run with endurance. There's our word. The race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. I love this because what he doesn't say is, you know, Jesus is going to fix your problems. You know, if you just need to pray the right way or have the right kind of faith and all your hardships are just going to melt away. He said the way that you can keep yourself from growing weary or faint hearted is to keep him in mind. Remember what he did for you on your behalf. Remember what he came and didn't have to do, but he suffered anyway. He suffered for you in your place. That's the kind of guy that you follow. Consider him so that you don't lose heart. You look to the cross, you look at what Jesus did, and Mike, do you really have too many complaints about what you have to endure? The answer, of course, is no, it does not compare. I love the description of love that describes Jesus so well that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 13. Notice, almost everything I read here connects to endurance, connects to perseverance. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. You only get that way when you're in the midst of trouble and pain, right? It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That is the kind of love that God wants us developing muscles for. As we face hardship, not allowing our emotions to just take us wherever we want to react, but instead to develop endurance, to slow down, to think, to ask ourselves some important questions about the situation that we're going through. Looking to the examples of Paul, the example of Jesus, realizing that the, the one who came as God in the flesh also went through pain and did not hold himself back from the kind of experiences that we call hardships. You are loved by God. He demonstrated that by sending his son that you might have the hope of eternal life. And in the meantime, have an example that can carry you through, that can inspire you, that can help you stay on the right kind of track, demonstrating to you how it can be done. Not somebody asking for something, but they themselves never got their hands dirty with it. He got in and lived among us so that he might experience everything that we experience. And because of his example, we can have hope. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That's what you sang. Because he lives, because I've seen his example, and I trust in him. It's your faith and your trust that Satan wants to put to the test every single time you're up against trouble. But the answer we give is the answer of endurance. Maybe this morning you've come down to the, the E line. You know, your, your needle is pointing at E as far as endurance. I'm not sure I can make it through. And maybe you need people to surround you. Maybe you don't need to just put on a smile and pretend everything's happy because you're in the midst of hardship. And you need the strength of others to help you through, just as Paul said he's relying on to get him through his difficulties. Well, we're here for you. And we want to help you make it through. We want to help you persevere so that you and all of us together, we can live lives that glorify God. If you need to respond to this message today, then come as we stand and sing.